And again, welcome to everyone joining us via Zoom and also via our Facebook page. And we wanna welcome you officially to the Area Agency on Aging's 1Bs, the COVID-19 vaccine, what seniors and caregivers should know webinar. Uh, today will be all about getting information in relation to the vaccine. We have a wonderful speaker um, and we hope to be able to have you leave here more educated and informed than when you got here with us. Just a couple of housekeeping uh, things before we get started. So when you registered, you were asked if you had any questions for our speaker. So we were able to capture those questions. And after the presentation is over, after our doctor has given her her talk, we're gonna go right to those questions and start with those and have her answer. Um, we hopefully will have some time to take some live questions after that. But um, if you ask the question prior to when you register, we'll hopefully be able to get to that as well. So feel free to engage in the chat. We're going to be placing some information throughout the webinar. You can put questions there. Uh, you can put comments there. And um, that's an open forum. And then at the end of the presentation, we will do the question and answer period. And with that, I want to introduce the CEO of the Area Agency on Aging 1B, Mr. Michael Carson, who will give some other information and introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome. As mentioned, I'm Michael. Michael Carson, the President and CEO of the Area Agency on Aging 1B. I want to thank you for joining us today for this very important topic. We're excited to have you here and grateful to have a wonderful speaker that will give us good information. So welcome. I'd like to take a minute to talk briefly about our organization, the Area Agency on Aging. If you're not familiar, we're a nonprofit that helps older adults, people with disabilities, and family caregivers. We serve as six counties in Southeast Michigan, including Livingston, Macomb, Monroe, Oakland, St. Clair, and Washtenaw. Our services focus on helping people live safely and independently in their home with dignity and support as needed. Um, most of our funds come from the government or grants and a variety of programs, to name a few, in-home care programs. We have a call center or resource center that connects people with care and services. I'm sure many of you have heard of Meals on Wheels. We fund those programs in our six counties. We help people with Medicare and Medicaid, help with transportation, and we have a whole array of other services not listed. Our resource center is an incredible place to start. It's the gateway to our agency. So you can find compassionate people that are well skilled. They have great knowledge for services within our agency and outside of our agency as well within the community. To get a hold of them, call 800 852 7795. That's 800 852 7795. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to acknowledge and thank some organizations that partnered with us today. Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, Theta Zeta Lambda Chapter in Ann Arbor, and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Natasha Bagdasarian. Dr. Bagdasarian is a senior health physician with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. She has an incredibly rich background in both public health and epidemiology. She has her MD, holds a master in public health and molecular epidemiology. Uh, she's completed her residency at the uh, internal medicine at the University of Michigan, where she also completed a fellowship in infectious disease. She consults with the World Health Organization on international breakout preparedness and response. She has numerous peer review publications in the field of infectious disease, including several publications on COVID-19. We're incredibly lucky to have her here today. Uh, this is a topic we learn about and hear about all day long. So about COVID vaccine is now the new subject and the subject that's most on people's mind. So doctor, we appreciate you being here and now I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. And I'm so pleased to be here today. Um, I really um, think this vaccine is um, a wonderful, wonderful tool for us to get out of this pandemic. And I'd like to share some information with you. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and share my screen. I don't have a very long presentation and I would love to hear your questions. So um, hopefully you can see my screen. I'll go over a little bit of um, prepared information and then we can have a discussion. I think discussion is a great way to share this information. Um, I will start out by talking a little bit about the vaccine approval process. I know that there's been a lot of concerns about the COVID vaccines and the fact that we got these vaccines so fast. 
Um, and I want to say that the, the vaccine approval process and the way that vaccines are made is the same. Nothing was skipped with these two new vaccines that we're using in the state of Michigan. There were absolutely no phases skipped. So when a vaccine comes out, there's always a phase one trial, which answers, is the vaccine safe? And that's usually small. So 20 to 100 healthy volunteers. Then comes phase two, where we're looking for things like common side effects and how your immune system is reacting to the vaccine. That's a few hundred. And then phase three, there are tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of participants. And that's really looking at, is the vaccine effective on a broad scale? And again, looking for things like side effects. So these vaccines went through this process. They just went through the process a little bit faster because this is a global pandemic. Um, there are two vaccines that we're using here in the US and in the state of Michigan. And the technology behind the vaccines is essentially the same. So these are both mRNA vaccines. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how those vaccines work, but it's amazing technology. Um, the main differences between the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine is that the Pfizer vaccine is stored at ultra cold temperature, whereas the Moderna vaccine is just stored at merely cold temperatures. Pfizer is approved for ages 16 and up, and that just has to do with how they did the studies. Moderna is approved for ages 18 and up, Pfizer gets a second dose in 21 days. Moderna gets a second dose in 28 days. But these vaccines are amazingly safe and effective. So the vaccines are both about 95% effective in stopping people from having um, COVID-19 disease, which is amazing. Um, there are many vaccines around that are significantly less effective. So 95% is really wonderful. The vaccines do have the potential to cause some side effects. So pain at the site of injection, headache, maybe even some fever, but that's less common, fatigue, chills, some achiness, the typical things that we would see when people get any other vaccine. So a flu shot, for example. Um, I've had my first, um, my first uh, vaccination so far, and other than very, very mild achiness in my arm, I had no problems at all. So how do these vaccines work? As I mentioned, this is amazing technology. When I talk about um, this pandemic, this pandemic has been so hard on so many people and it's caused so much heartache, so many lives lost. But if there is any silver lining to the pandemic, it's this vaccine technology and our potential now to use the same technology in the future. So the way that these vaccines work is with most vaccines, they are either a piece of a virus or the whole virus that's been inactivated or killed that's grown in a chicken egg, for example. These are different. So these do not have the whole virus. Um, there's no live virus. There's no dead virus. It's just a tiny little piece of genetic material in essentially a little fat bubble that travels inside of your cells and your own cells make one of the proteins. And then your immune system reacts to this protein and detects it. So it's amazing technology and it allows for vaccines to be made really fast. There's no growing uh, viruses in chicken eggs, for example. So there's a lot of potential here to solve um, human diseases in the future and a lot of diseases that have caused a lot of uh, human death and suffering through the world. So amazing technology. Vaccine rollout is being done in a very staggered um, and um, stepwise way. So the first was phase 1A, where we immunized healthcare providers and people living in long-term care facilities. And that was really done because that's where outbreaks were happening. So outbreaks were happening in long-term care facilities. And we want to make sure that healthcare facilities are open. So we want to make sure that hospitals remain open so that if people are having heart attacks or strokes or other medical conditions that hospitals are available to take care of them. So that was a reason for phase 1A. Phase 1B that we're in now is for essential workers. We've also included adults over the age of 65. And next in phase 1C will be adults with high risk medical conditions. There is overlap between these phases. So we're not going, we're not finishing one phase and moving to the next. There's gonna be overlap um, in order to get the absolute most number of shots in arms. So our goal is to immunize 70% of our population 
as quickly as we can. So the goal is to get to a place where we call it herd immunity, where we know that we can no longer have massive outbreaks. There's still a chance for outbreaks to happen, but herd immunity would prevent some of those really, really big outbreaks and super spreader events from happening. And there's a lot of great information on the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services website um, that shows you exactly how we've been doing here in the state with our vaccine um, administration. So you can see that so far in the state of Michigan, we have put 800,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccination into arms, which is wonderful. And you can see that this number over time, so here you're looking at this curve over time, the numbers just keep going up and up, which is really a wonderful thing. There's information on who has been receiving the vaccine. So you can see female versus male. You can take a look at the age distribution. So in the beginning, it was a lot of younger people getting vaccinated because of healthcare workers. And now you can see that because of long-term care and older adults getting immunized, that age distribution has changed a little bit. And now we've had a lot of people over the age of 50, over the age of 65, and over the age of 75 who have been vaccinated. So this is really wonderful because the goal is to protect our vulnerable populations. And um, here are some resources. So the information that I pulled out at the end is from our michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine website. There's also a link on that website that you can click on to learn where vaccines are being given close to you. And we have a COVID hotline on here as well. So I do wanna say that one of the problems we're dealing with right now is that even though vaccine is currently being offered to people in certain, in certain groups, so for example, frontline workers, healthcare workers, and older adults, there aren't enough doses for everyone in those groups to get vaccine right now. So your best bet is to keep looking for appointments in your area. And when one becomes available, take the first, um, take the first available opportunity you can to get vaccinated. So we know that not everyone over 65, not everyone who's working in any, any sort of frontline industry will be vaccinated um, you know, in the next few weeks, for example. It will take longer, but our goal is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So a few resources for you here. And that's the end of my prepared remarks. And I would love to hear what questions people have today. Mute. All right, thank you so much. Dr. Bagdasarian, thank you so much for that information. And we did quite have quite a few questions that were sent. So I'm gonna go right to those. Let me just pull these up. And um, there's a couple questions in the chat that we'll be able to hopefully get to as well. All right, so our first question of the day is, let's see here. Pull these up. And I do apologize. I was actually answering another question. And OK, here we go. All right, so the first question I have is, um, where should I register so they'll know that I need the vaccine? Should I register in more than one place with my county and my healthcare system or just stay with one place? Um, so the, the best way to, um, to get a vaccine right now would be to go to the website that I mentioned, look to see where the vaccine is being given in your area. And if they have a registration link, go ahead and complete that. If you want to complete that registration in a couple of different places, that's fine too. Um, and just when you get called or when you're told that there's an appointment available, um, you know, make sure that you take that appointment, that you don't cancel the appointment or, or don't show up for the appointment because our goal is to not waste a single dose. So I think it's fine to go ahead and sign up in a couple of different places, so long as you're letting them know if they call you back that you've already been vaccinated and you don't need one, um, because we wanna make sure that if there's an appointment available and if you don't need that appointment, it goes to someone else who does need it. Okay, thank you. Next question is, will older people who have specific underlying conditions be able to get vaccinated sooner? And what about those with Alzheimer's or dementia? Um, so, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can to, to risk stratify and get people the vaccine who need it the most, um, but it may not always work out that way. So 
if you're if you feel that you're in one of the groups who's eligible to get the vaccine right now, so if you're in that over age 65 group, um, go ahead, take a look online, see if there are appointments near you. If your healthcare system is giving out the vaccine, see if you can register with them. They may not ask a lot of those questions about other uh, medical conditions. In a perfect world, we would be able to really um, immunize people who are the very highest risk before moving down the down the list further. But um, it's it's difficult to really do things in such a very specific way when the goal is to get as many people immunized as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, how can homebound seniors get the vaccine? That's something that's being worked out. Um, so hopefully we will have more information for you in the upcoming weeks. Um, if it's someone who is homebound and living in a long-term care facility, then vaccines were sent to long-term care facilities. Um, and most long-term care facilities around the state have already received vaccine. For people who are homebound in a private residence, uh, we are working on ways to get vaccine to those folks as well. And just know that the Area Agency on Aging 1B, we're staying very close to information as it's released, as the doctor just mentioned. So once that information is known and ready, we'll make sure to disseminate it. Um, you can always check our website. We have a whole section specifically dedicated to the COVID-19 vaccine, which is information on who to call, um, your health department. So you can always go to aaa1b.org to access that as well. Um, okay, next question. Should I get vac the vaccine if I have already recovered or tested positive for the virus? So if you have COVID-19 right now, so if you've had COVID-19 um, very recently, so say in the last 10 days or so, this is not a good time to get vaccinated for you. But if you're someone who has had COVID in the past and have recovered, um, we are still recommending vaccination for those individuals because we're not quite sure how long natural immunity will last. So say you had COVID two months ago or a month ago, you are eligible to receive the vaccine. Thank you. Um, next question. Information seems to be quickly changing and evolving. What's the best source to get good information on the virus and the vaccine? The best sources are um, the CDC always and information will continue to be updated there, um, as well as the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services website and your local health department websites. I know that there are lots of questions coming up and sometimes it's more reassuring to talk to someone live. Um, it's difficult right now if you're trying to call your local health department because they're so busy with the plans to actually roll out vaccination programs that there may not be someone who's there to answer your phone calls. Um, so I would say that those websites are the best way to find um, the most current information. So CDC, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and local health departments. Thank you. And we're putting these links in the chat um, as we're presenting and speaking. So please access that. You can also go to um, our website. We have a lot of the information there as well. Um, so thank you. Uh, next question, doctor. Uh, let's see. Now we're going to get into some vaccine specifics. Um, can you, ex well, you already went through the, the, the differences between the two, I know, in your presentation. Um, I don't know if you touched on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. That's also a I, question. I, I didn't. Um, it's not a vaccine that we're using at this moment in time, and we'll find out more um, data as, as time goes on. Okay. Um, for the vaccine that requires two doses, how far apart should the two doses be? Will someone let me know when it's time for me to get my second dose, and will that second dose be available when I need it? What if the second dose is not received? Um, so there's a lot of logistics going on behind the scenes to make sure that first doses and second doses are matched up. So that's essentially what the federal government is working on. And that's what local health departments and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services are all trying to make sure that there are second doses available for people who've received first doses. Um, both of the vaccines that we're using right now do need two doses. And typically what is happening is you make an appointment to get your first dose and then on the day that you receive your first dose, you sign up for your second dose. And so local health departments and other um, facilities that are providing the vaccine should be monitoring their supply chains very closely to make sure that there are second doses available for those who've had a first dose 
if there happens to be a problem. So if there are problems and shortfalls at some point, that second dose could be delayed. We don't know how long um, the second dose can safely be delayed, but you would just get your second dose as soon as that's available. Okay, thank you. Next question, does the vaccine present me from getting COVID-19 completely or just reduce the severity? So these vaccines are about 95% efficacious, which means that if um, there are 100 people who receive the vaccine, 95% of them won't develop symptoms of COVID-19 if they're exposed. So the, the vaccines are very efficacious, which is wonderful. But um, that is number one, looking at people who develop symptomatic COVID. So what we don't know right now is could people still have um, a little bit of um, a mild infection where they're not really experiencing any symptoms and still potentially transmit the virus. So we don't really know that part of it yet. Um, and we do know that for the small percentage of people who still get the infection after receiving a uh, vaccine, that the infection is much less severe. So those severe cases of COVID um, are, um, are, are almost zero. Um, from the data that we have right now. So where people end up on ventilators and very, very sick in the hospital, those, um, the vaccines are very good at preventing against that type of illness. Thank you. And if you're just joining us, you're here with the Area Agency on Aging 1B. And we're speaking today with Dr. Bagdasarian from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, she's giving us information on the COVID-19 vaccine and answering questions on it. Okay, so uh, next question. If I get the vaccine, will I still need to wear a mask? Can I still be a carrier? What precautions do I need to take after I get the vaccine? So at the moment, we are still recommending that people who get the vaccine, who get two doses of the vaccine, continue to use all these safe practices, which means masking and social distancing. And that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, I mentioned this piece about the vaccine being really, really good at preventing illness, symptoms, and severe symptoms but we don't know if it's still possible to transmit the virus, to have a mild case, you could call it, and still be able to pass the, the, the virus to other people. So we don't know if they prevent that. The other thing is with such a small percentage of people being vaccinated, it's really hard to be able to know who's vaccinated and who isn't. So for example, if we were to make a different rule for people who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated going to stores, for example, there would be no way of telling who's vaccinated and who's not. The goal is to get so many people vaccinated in society that even if there are still a few people who are not vaccinated, that at least large outbreaks couldn't happen. So that would be the goal. And once we achieve that goal, then that would really be the time that we can start thinking about relaxing those mitigation measures. So for now, the advice is that when you receive the vaccine, you just continue to do the same precautions. Okay, thank you. Next question is, how long does the protection last? Will we need new boosters in the future? That's a really good question. And the answer is we don't really know. So because the virus is so new, the virus has not even been with us for a year yet. And the vaccine is also so new, we don't really know how long immunity will last. There are also some variants coming out right now that indicate that the virus is mutating, it is changing, it probably will change more over time. And it's possible that there will be variants for whom or for which we need to tweak the vaccine a little bit. So it's possible that we will either need boosters to boost our immune response or that we'll need um, changes to the vaccine formula to make sure that it's still working against new strains of the virus in the future. But those are still to be seen and still to be determined. Great segue, doctor, because that was actually the next question. Will the booster be, will a new booster be needed to cover new strains? So thank you for that. Um, can you explain more about the 14 day waiting period after getting the, sink, the shingles vaccine? Um, because this vaccine is so new, we are essentially recommending that you don't get any other vaccines within 14 days of this vaccine. And, and part of that is because 
there's so much monitoring for side effects right now. So if you did get another vaccine and had a fever or had a problem, we would want to know whether or not it was from the COVID vaccine or from something else. So that's why right now we re recommend that this vaccine is given alone and no other vaccines are given in that 14 day window. Okay, I'm going to grab some questions from the chat uh, just to mix it up a little bit. Uh, Linda, who is with us in the chat, she said, someone just mentioned to me that the previous in the previous meeting that you cannot take ibuprofen or Tylenol at the time that you have the vaccine. Does that also apply to mel melotoxin? Also, how long does this restriction apply? Um, it's not so much a restriction as a little bit of a theoretical concern. So there are some theoretical concerns that potentially if you take some anti-inflammatory drugs, how will that affect the way your body um, has an immune reaction after the vaccine? Because remember, we want your body to have an immune reaction. We want you to be able to recognize this. It's a little bit of a theoretical concern. Um, if your doctor is telling you that you shouldn't take Tylenol or ibuprofen for other reasons, you would follow their advice. Um, but for right now, I would say that if you need to take one of those medications, there's no real clear data that, that says you, you, you can't. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Juliet. Is it true that even though you get the vaccine, you can still co contact the virus, contact the virus and carry it as a carrier? That's, sh you shouldn't get yourself sick, but you can still get others sick. So um, a carrier state is a little bit different, but we don't know whether um, people can, uh, we don't know whether people will receive the vaccine and they could still get an asymptomatic infection and still transmit the, uh, the virus onto others. That is true. So we're not quite sure yet, um, but the key is that we know that the vaccines are really, really good at preventing serious illness. And so that's, that, that's um, a huge accomplishment because we, we wanna protect individuals, we wanna protect our healthcare systems, we wanna protect our infrastructure, schools, long-term care facilities. And so making sure that people don't get very sick, that people don't get hospitalized and that people don't die is a huge benefit to these vaccines. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mara, as she said, she's scheduled for the uh, vaccine tomorrow, actually, um, but she's afraid to go. Part of her waiver says, I understand that I'm being offered the COVID-19 vaccine under an EUA and that clinical trials related to the COVID-19 uh, trials related to COVID-19 are ongoing. She says, this scares me. Ongoing, does that mean that there's some long-term effects that I don't know about? I think that um, that language is really designed to show that they're still collecting data. The, the vaccines have been through phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials, which is what vaccines need to go through to get approved. The EUA is emergency approval, and essentially everything we're doing in the COVID world is done under emergency approval because we never needed to move so fast before. So all of our testing is essentially approved under these EUAs. All of the treatments that are being used in hospitals are essentially being used under EUAs. Uh, and the same for the vaccines. It's all in an attempt to get this done faster and avoid some of the red tape. There is still data being collected on these vaccines. I would say that there has never been so much attention, uh, worldwide attention to, a, uh, to, to new vaccines. And so these vaccines have been developed with so much attention, so much media attention. They've been developed under a microscope. So if there are problems, um, you will hear about them. That information will be revealed. Um, I can tell you that I received my first shot. It went off uh, fine without a problem. I'm getting my second shot next week and I'm really excited because I think this is, um, you know, it means that I'm extra protected and it also means I'm protecting my family. Um, so my husband's not eligible for his vaccine yet, but by me getting vaccinated, it's protecting him. I have a six-year-old son. He can't get vaccinated, he's too young. But again, by me getting vaccinated, I'm protecting him. My 
Mom has received both of her doses. I was so excited for her. So I know that it's nerve wracking because this is new. This is all so new. Um, but, but I really see the vaccination as being an opportunity for us to get back to some sense of normalcy. I don't think that life will ever go back to 2019. Um, we have been through collectively so much and not just in Michigan, not just in the country, but so much all over the world, uh, pain and suffering caused by COVID-19. Um, but I, I would love to get to a place where we can be with each other, where we can hug our loved ones, where we can go to weddings and, and, and be with the people we care about. And this vaccine is a step in that direction. So I, I know there are people out there who are nervous, um, but I would tell you to take that plunge because the risk from a vaccine is far, far lower than the risk of having a bad outcome from COVID. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have a question on our Facebook page. Um, is data available for the impact of the vaccine on those with com compromised immune systems? You know, if you have a specific medical condition where you're really unsure about your personal risk, and you're unsure if the vaccine is right for you, the safest thing to do is to talk to your doctor. So there's a lot of data available, but the data for very specific medical conditions may not be there. So the best thing to do if you have specific concerns about a condition that you have and your risk benefit uh, for taking the vaccine or not taking it is talk to your physician. Okay. Uh, next question. Um... Any concerns for people taking immunosuppressants <laughs> or people with autoimmune disease? Again, if you have specific concerns about a medication you're on, about a medical condition that you have, um, I would talk to your physician before you get the vaccine. Um, the the um, there are so many variety of illnesses and variety of medications that I can't comment on everything. Um, I can tell you that this vaccine is safe and effective for the vast majority of people. But if there's something you're concerned about, I would make an appointment to speak to your doctor. Um, a lot of physicians are doing uh, telemedicine and are doing consults over Zoom and other platforms. So I would schedule an appointment with someone who knows your medical history, who can review your medical history and can give you specific um, information. Thank you. Um, is there any concern for people taking blood thinners? Will, uh, will the vaccine lower uh, platelet counts? So typically the vaccine will not lower platelet counts, but of course, you know, if someone has very, very low platelets, even the simple act of using a needle and injecting a needle, they can end up with a really nasty hematoma or a, a big nasty bruise. Um, and, and so if you are someone who has bleeding problems, again, I would talk to your physician and see if this is the right time for you to get a vaccine or what you can do to lower your risk. Okay. Um, this question, and you kind of answered it, but not directly. Um, I've heard about allergic reactions. Should I be concerned? Is it safe for people who have adverse effects to other vaccines, such as the flu shot? So this vaccine is a little bit different because it's not, um, it's not produced in the same way that other vaccines have been produced. So um, it, it's, it's really hard to tell who is going to have an, uh, a reaction to this. There are some components to the vaccine. There are some preservatives and things that can potentially cause allergic reactions. So again, if you've had an allergic reaction to a medication or to an injectable that you're concerned about, the safest thing would be to talk to your physician before you go ahead and get the vaccine. So the, the vaccination clinics are usually big affairs where you're not really having one-on-one -on -one interaction with a doctor who knows your specific medical condition. So I think if you're going to be going to a big vaccination event and you have something specific in your medical history that bothers you, I would talk to your doctor before you sign up for an event like this um, so that you can really go through those specific questions. Again, for the vast majority of people, this vaccine is very safe. All vaccines have a potential, and in fact, all medications have a potential to cause an allergic reaction in some people. Um, but I would review your history with your doctor before you uh, before you go for the shot if you are concerned. Thank you. And again, just for anyone that may be joining us over Facebook Live or joining our webinar, 
We're here, you're here with the Area Agency on Aging 1B. We are discussing the COVID-19 vaccine and what you should know specifically in reference to seniors and family caregivers. We have uh, Dr. Bagdasarian from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services who is answering questions from our audience. So um, we're now gonna go to the Facebook chat. We finished all of the pre-registration questions. If you're on the Zoom or on Facebook Live and have a question for the doctor, feel free to post it um, or to uh, put it in the chat and we'll go ahead and get those answered. Maria asks, the problem is even though my loved one is eligible to receive the vaccine and we are signed up through my chart, he hasn't received the go ahead to make his appointment. He is 74 with Alzheimer's. Any help with this? Um, yeah, this is this is the challenge. There are a lot of people out there who want the vaccine, um, who have not been able to get the vaccine yet. Um, and then there are a lot of people who um, have been offered the vaccine who don't want it. So it's a matter of matching up the vaccine with people who are willing to take it. Um, and so that is causing some of these logistical issues. Um, the best way to um, to get the shot right now is to keep checking the MDHHS website to look for sites near you that may be offering the vaccine. So this could be a local health department, it could be a pharmacy. Keep checking back, see if appointments are available and appointments open up. So you may check today and there may not be anything and you may check tomorrow and there might be um, appointments. For those of you who don't um, use the internet or don't have internet access, you can also call 211 for further details on where the vaccine is available. And I also put the number for the COVID-19 hotline uh, in the chat as well. So those are some other resources. And we, we know at this time, there, there are not enough doses of the vaccine for everyone who's eligible to receive the vaccine. It's simply a, it's a fact. And um, we are requesting patience. And um, if, if you can't get the vaccine yet, keep checking and when you become, or when it becomes available to you, um, you know, please go ahead and, and take it at the first available opportunity. Thank you, okay. Um, can you address COVID scams? We've had a couple questions on how to avoid scams, anything about how to protect yourself from scammers. Ooh, this is a good question. I'm I'm not sure about COVID scams. Do you have any um, any more info for me about that? Are we talking about people calling with uh, inaccurate information, or what type of scams? Well, we had two just general questions. I know we we try to really educate our population, our older adults and caregivers, just on scams in general. Um, for seniors, we uh, get updated information and we put it out there. Um, and Kathleen, if you maybe wanted to jump in with it, yeah, I, I I did some of the some of the advice that we're giving our Medicare beneficiaries is to remember that it's it's likely not to cost anything to for them to get the vaccine, and that they should never be required to pay to get on a list to get in line. Um, so if somebody calls you or contacts you promising that you that, that, that they can get you on a list or get you do you in line, if you give them information or money, please, please don't. <laughs> please don't. You should be looking for information from your county health department or your, uh, your health system, your health care provider. Those are the two places that right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Bagdasarian, those are the people that should be able to get you on that list. Or, or get you vaccinated. So, so please don't, if people are asking you for money, that's, that's a sure sign that that's a scam. Or, or even pharmacies. So pharmacies um, do have, or, or are starting to get access to some of these um, vaccine doses as well. But all of the vaccine has been purchased by the federal government. And so all of these doses are being provided free of cost. So no matter who gives you your vaccination, it should be free. Okay. Thank you, thank you for that. And if you have any questions just in relation to scams and, and information, we always want you to know that, as Kathleen said, Area Agency on Aging 1B is here. You can give us a call at our 800 number, 852-7795. Um, uh, we cover pretty much the, the gamut with information in reference to scams, be it Medicare or just general scams that um, are, our older adults may be prone to. Uh, another question, um, and, this, and this is a couple, a lot of people are saying they're caregivers for someone who is older, who is eligible for the vaccine, but they are not 
um, are they going to be able to get the vaccine before the last group? Uh, and if there's any, if there's going to be anything put into place for someone caring for an older adult to be able to receive the vaccine sooner. Um, so specifically, um, you know, for, for people who work in long-term care settings with older adults, um, there are vaccination campaigns going on. Um, in terms of people who are maybe providing one-on-one -on -one care, I'm not sure um, if they are considered to be in that um, in that same category, and I'd have to do some some checking on that and see if I can find out for you. Okay. Um, we're actually going to take a live question. I believe Suzanne uh, Latessa has her hand raised. Suzanne, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. And uh, if you'd like to ask your question live, um, <laughs> I will give you that opportunity. Oh, are you unmuted, Suzanne? I'm unmuted. Yes, thank you. Uh, doc, doctor, uh, my friend from South Carolina just said uh, she's very informed that that African strain is now in on our continent. And from what I've read about it, instead of the spikes being upright, like north and south, so that the vaccine or autoimmunity, if you've had the virus before, can recognize it, it's bent. So that the current vaccines and the current autoantibodies do not recognize it. Have you heard anything about that African strain? Yeah. So um, really, really good question. So there are a few variants out there right now. Um, and the, um, the UK variant is um, here in Michigan already, and we're watching very closely for the South African and Brazilian variants. The UK variant does, um, the, the vaccine does seem to work effectively against the UK variant. There is some concern that the vaccine may not be as effective mm -hmm. towards the South African and Brazilian variants. Now, it probably won't be that the vaccine doesn't work at all against them. It's possible that it is less effective. But our goal is still to get as many um, people vaccinated as possible. That is the best way to ensure that we can try to get ahead of some of these variants. So the more that this virus has an opportunity to circulate and replicate, the more of these variants uh, that could potentially emerge. So the goal is still to get as many people vaccinated as possible and to really, really double down on those mitigation measures. So masking and social distancing, avoiding indoor gatherings, avoiding large gatherings, that's really the best bet to staying ahead of these variants. And there will be more variants. This is, um, this is how viruses work. They replicate, they make mistakes when they replicate, and they um, end up with mutations and we end up with variant strains. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay, a couple questions just in general. People are nervous because the virus or the vaccine was created so quickly. Um, someone asked what exactly does the vaccine do exactly? Um, and I think you touched on a little bit earlier about if people can develop reactions later on from getting the vaccine, but just anything you want to maybe just touch on and just in relation to general myths that you want to dispel that you hear, you know, often that, you know, people seem to have a, a fear of. So um, there's a lot of concerns about how quickly the vaccine was developed, but I do want to remind everyone that um, there were decades and decades of vaccine development and vaccine research that this was all built on. So this particular technology that I talked about, the mRNA technology, this is not something that was invented for the COVID-19 vaccine. This is something that had been developed um, years before we had ever heard of COVID-19. Uh, it just never had a chance to be used in a vaccine before. Um, so this is amazing technology and there are many, many years of research in this technology before we ever heard of COVID. Um, then once we heard of COVID, the things that made it go really fast is there's technology now where we sequence the entire genome. We were able to look at the entire genome of this virus um, within about the first month. And, and that has never been done before. So usually that process itself takes a long time. And then because of this mRNA technology and the platform already being there, then we could um, develop vaccine very quickly rather than waiting for this long process of growing vaccine in eggs um, and, and, and uh, a more lengthy traditional process. But the research and development for this was already present and being worked on. Um, and 
our, our research so far, all of the phase one, two, and three studies show that this vaccine is safe and effective. So um, I understand that it's nerve wracking and there are a lot of uncertainties um, right now in the world and this feels like taking another big chance, but this vaccine is our best chance of getting out of this pandemic. Um, 2020 was a difficult year, 2021, has also gotten off to a little bit of a rocky start. And um, we're really hoping that the vaccine is the light at the end of the tunnel, that getting people vaccinated, getting to herd immunity is our chance to be able to come together as, as a community, as a society again. Okay, thank you. Um, someone else, okay, someone asked for a little clarification in reference to when you said earlier about you were getting the vaccine, um, and you're protecting your family, but then you said that the vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting the virus, but rather it makes you uh, much less sick. So they wanted just a little bit of an explanation on how getting it can help your family from getting sick. Yeah, I saw that in the chat. So I'm, oh. I thank you for addressing that. Um, yeah, so um, I had said earlier that we are not sure if the vaccine completely prevents people from having mild infections where they still could transmit the virus without showing a lot of symptoms. Um, and then I also went on to say that I got the vaccine to protect my loved ones. And what I really mean by that is that even though there is some, some uncertainty as to whether the vaccine protects um, from even the mildest cases, chances are that it will help stop transmission. So chances are that um, even if people do have low levels of the virus replicating and they still are potentially able to transmit the virus, chances are it'll be much less in people who are vaccinated versus people who are unvaccinated. So the likelihood of developing a big bad infection where you're spewing out large amounts of virus into the air are going to be lower. Okay, thank you. And again, you're here. We have a few more minutes. Um, you're here with the Area Agency on Aging 1B and our COVID-19 vaccine webinar, specifically um, addressing issues from older adults and also their family caregivers about the vaccine. We're here with Dr. Bagdasarian, who's answering questions and giving great information. If you're on our Facebook page, you can still post your question. And if you're in the Zoom, feel free to post in the chat. Uh, another question from our Facebook page, uh, someone asked, are you safe between the first and second vaccine uh, are you protected during that time or are you only protected after both doses? So the way that vaccines work uh, in general and also for this one is that usually when it's a multiple dose vaccine, there's some protection after the first dose, but that protection is much more after the second dose. So there's likely to be some amount of protection after the first dose, but the way the studies have been done show the protection is much greater after the second dose. So your greatest protection is after you've had the second dose and you've given your immune system some time to really um, develop a response. So a couple of weeks after that second dose is probably when you have your best chance of being protected against the virus. But again, no virus, no vaccine is 100% efficacious and no one is 100% protected even after both those doses. So that's why we're still recommending these mitigation measures um, even after both doses of the vaccine. Okay, in part two of that question, I actually see in the chat, someone asked, is the second shot the same composition and strength as the first? It is, yep. It is the, the same shot that we're giving you a second time. And the only difference is that your immune system has already seen it a little bit and you're giving your immune system a chance to rev up. So the first time your immune system sees this protein, it says, hmm, maybe this is a little bit suspicious. I'm going to remember this one. The second time it sees that protein, your immune system is saying, hey, this is a threat. This is the second time I've seen it, and you're having a bigger immune response. Thank you. And while we um, have a few more minutes, I just want to specifically ask you to speak to, because we have, we have a lot of family caregivers who are on our Facebook page who are part of this, um, this webinar. We get a lot of calls from family caregivers, those caring for older adults, trying to make sure that they're able to help them navigate through this, this, this time. So is there anything specifically you would give 
to our caregivers, because I've seen a couple comments saying, you know, caregivers need answers, caregivers are out here, you know, trying to make it happen, and we, we're, you know, we, we need direction. Anything specifically you would want our care, a family caregiver to know if you're caring for someone over 60 to help them help their older adult through getting to the, the vaccine, educating them, and helping them to get access to it? Um, I think the biggest thing, and, and I've actually been hearing this from a lot of my friends who are caring for their um, elderly parents, um, is frustration um, with when can we get the vaccine, um, that my loved ones are elderly, my loved ones need this vaccine, and, and how can they get them and when can they get them. So the, the biggest thing is to keep checking some of those websites that we've given information on. So the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services website your local health department website, keep checking to see if appointments become available. If you hear about vaccine availability through um, a healthcare system, get your name down you know, as soon as you can, wait for an appointment. If you are offered an appointment, try to take the very first one you're offered um, because slots are filling up. Anytime you're making an appointment, there's always a chance that things will get reshuffled and you may, you know, they may not have vaccine on that day and you may get delayed a little bit. So the other thing I'm asking for is patience. I know this isn't easy. Um, and I know that I, you know, I, I wish we could just snap our fingers and have all of these shots distributed to where they need to go. But logistically, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, it's been an uncertain time in, in the country as well. And, um, you know, there was a change in administration during all of this. So please bear with us. Um, we're trying to get as many vaccines as we can for the citizens of Michigan, and we're trying to get them out to our most vulnerable populations as soon as we can. So I know it's frustrating. I know that this, um, that some people are waiting and even though your loved ones are eligible, you're still waiting for appointments to become available. Don't give up hope, it will happen. Um, and I, I just wanna thank you for your patience. Thank you for, um, you know, for everything you're doing from masking to distancing to keep your loved ones safe. Thank you. And um, we have someone who lives here locally, but her mom is in uh, New York. So she's trying to get information and we know every state is different, but she was asking that, um, she's hearing that some pharmacies are setting appointments and it may kind of be a centralized thing with that pharmacy. She wants to know, is there a central place that you can go to find out possible places like pharmacies that have appointments available? Yep, so that was the MDHHS dot gov slash COVID vaccine link that I put in the chat. Um, there is a button on there that says, where can I get my vaccine? And if you click on that, it'll tell you um, places in your community where you can get the vaccine. And we'll place that in the chat again. I know Kathleen's on it. Um, so we'll place that in. And then we'll also include that um, in the information that we're gonna send out. Uh, we had a question if this is, will be recorded and if it could be sent after. It is being recorded. So everyone who pre-registered will get this presentation sent to them so that you can watch it even after um, it's over. Um, and we're coming up on the end of our hour, just checking to see if there's any more questions. Um, again, if you're on Facebook, please feel free to post your questions in the comment. And thank you, Kathleen. Kathleen has put that uh, Michigan.gov address that Dr. Bagdasarian just referenced and the COVID hotline in the chat uh, if you would like to reference that. And again, um, that COVID hotline is 1-888-535-6136. Um, let's see. Please comment again on how long the vaccine lasts. I have heard one year, but I think you said you weren't sure. I think that is something that uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um, right now, the, the virus has not even been with us for a year. So in terms of how long immunity lasts, how long natural immunity lasts, how long vaccine-related immunity lasts, that is all information that we're still learning. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, and someone said there's no category for family caregivers or paid caregivers who work providing care at home on the oakland.gov site. You have to register as a general person. So that was just um, an informational comment. Uh, 
Suzanne said, thank you, doctor and moderator, be well. Thank you very much, Suzanne, as well. And again, if you're just joining us or you're just tuning in, um, you're here with the Area Agency on Aging 1B. We're hosting our COVID-19 vaccine webinar specifically about what seniors and family caregivers should know. Um, we're here with Dr. Bagdasarian from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And we're so glad we had an overwhelming response to this webinar. So hopefully you're getting your answers uh, the answers to your questions, you're getting information and resources that you can use after this. Uh, one question that was just placed in the chat, do you have any case of severe neurological, neuro, these medical terms are really throwing me off, neurological side effects because of the vaccine? So the, the side effects that have caught a lot of attention uh, recently have mostly been um, allergic reactions to the vaccine. Um, and you know, this vaccine, I mentioned before that it's really being looked at so closely. There has never been so much international attention on a vaccine before. So these vaccines, when, when you sign up and get your vaccine, not only are you reporting if you have any side effects, but you can actually sign up for text messages where you're being texted every day to say, how are you feeling? Are you feeling well? That's how closely these vaccines are being monitored. Um, and so, you know, we'll, there will be more reports, I'm sure, of, of adverse effects because every medication and every vaccine um, has some sort of um, uh, adverse event or side effects related to it. And, and this will be no different. But I can tell you that the risk of having a problem from COVID-19 infection is much lower than the risk of this vaccine. And when you ask about neurological problems, we know that there are neurological problems associated with COVID-19. Um, so there have been all kinds of issues and um, long hauler syndrome related to COVID-19. There have been strokes, um, blood clots, um, chronic lung issues, and even ongoing psychiatric and neurological issues have been reported. So um, the risk of having the infection is much greater than the risk of the vaccine. Thank you. And someone asked about Parkinson's, but that kind of, does that go in with what you just talked about, the different types of, okay, someone specifically asked if uh, there was any side effect for, or concern for people with Parkinson's. Oh, um, again, if you have a medical condition and you, you know, you're concerned about your specific risk, the best thing to do is to make an appointment with your doctor. A lot of doctors are doing uh, appointments over Zoom or um, other sort of teleconference methods. So um, the, the best thing to do if you are concerned about your specific risk and something in your medical history is talk to your doctor. Okay. Thank you. And I believe that is all we have for you, Dr. Bagdasarian. I think we got to all the questions, which was awesome. That was a, a kind of a fear of ours that we wouldn't be able to get to all the questions. So again, hopefully you received the information. Um, I'm looking in the chat and there's quite a few thank yous. This is very informative. Um, please look in the chat. Look on our Facebook page. We've posted a lot of the links and the numbers that were referenced today. We're going to compile all that and send that out as well. If you pre-register, you'll get that to your email. And before we say goodbye, I just want to make sure that everybody understands um, you're here with the Area Agency on Aging. We are a nonprofit dedicated to helping older adults remain living in the home independently. So we do a lot of information sharing, like bringing something like this to you today. And I just wanted to make sure that you understood if you needed anything, we help seniors and we help their families. Um, so if you're a family caregiver, if you're an older adult, we're all about helping older adults to stay in the home and live independently with services. So you could give us a call. We can help with home care, Meals on Wheels, transportation options, health and wellness and more. We service six counties. Um, including Macomb, Monroe, Oakland, St. Clair, and Washtenaw, but we're part of a national network. So that means no matter where you go, there is an area agency on aging in your area. 1B just happens to cover those six counties, but you can call us directly, 800-852-7795, Monday through Friday, eight to five, and speak with one of our resource specialists, or go to our website at aaa1b.org. We have a whole section on the COVID-19 vaccine with information on your health departments and where to call for to access through the health department. We have other resources and services. And again, we're always available 800-852-7795. I want to thank Dr. Bagdasarian for her assistance today. 
Um, when we put this together, we weren't really sure how we were gonna do it, but we're so glad that we had you to come on and speak to our audience today and get these questions answered. Um, we thank the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We partner, of course, a lot with them. We wanna thank the men of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, um, our Ann Arbor chapter, who was one of our promotional partners and helped us to put this together. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, we'll see you with the next one. You'll get an email from us. We have a lot of upcoming webinars coming um, and we hope everyone will stay tuned. And again, thank you, Dr. Bagnus Arian. Thank you so much for having me. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.